This is the story of my quantum trifecta, part two. I have now completed the trifecta, complete with FPV camera and Mobius and extended feet. And I've got my sunny sky motors. When we left part one, I had a floppy tail. As you see, that is now gone. It did turn out to be the Hobby King servo, this little servo here, and it was a stripped gear. Uh, I replaced it with an ES09MD, that's a Metal Gear digital servo, uh, recommended by the people in RC groups, and uh, it is Got the right number of splines, but you do have to put a little tiny spacer. In this case, I've got a, a nylon M3 nut in there, just acting as a spacer to move it out um, so that it's in the middle of the gears. Um, I have got my Sunny Sky motors, but I did have a couple of problems with them. First of all, the shaft on the Sunny Sky motors. Uh, extends from the base about 2.7 millimeters and the little gap, the little indentation on the front arms is only two millimeters deep so you either have to put spacers um, between the arms and the motors or as I did just drill out the center another millimeter or so um, so that it can accommodate the shafts. Now, although the Sunny Sky motors are a lower KV rating, um, it does actually hover at a lower throttle level, which is kind of strange. Another problem I had with the Sunny Sky motors um, is that they come in clockwise and counterclockwise versions, um, as I have two motors that return uh, turn counterclockwise. I got two of those and I've got one that turns clockwise, so I've got one of those. Unfortunately, that is not correct. The motors that are marked counterclockwise should actually rotate clockwise. The counterclockwise refers to the direction the nut on the motor needs to turn to tighten. Seems very strange way of doing things, but it basically means that when you hit something with one of these motors, um, the nut should tighten and press against it uh, and tighten. So, so when it's rotating counterclockwise, uh, a normal rotating um, propeller which goes counterclockwise, hits something, it's trying to force the nut to turn clockwise. So, of course, what happened was I had incorrect motors. So I had to order replacements for one of them. I needed two clockwise to rotate anti-clockwise and or counterclockwise and one counterclockwise to rotate clockwise. So of course the motors were out of stock again and I had to wait another two months before they came in. I thought I'd take a risk and I put the correct motors clockwise to rotate counterclockwise, counterclockwise to rotate clockwise and because I thought I wouldn't be reversing into anything I put the back motor as the other uh, counterclockwise motor rotating counterclockwise. But of course, what happened in my first outing, um, one of the front propellers hit a twig, um, the tricopter went down, uh, the motors were still rotating, and off came the back propeller. And I couldn't find the nut associated with it. And because it was a counterclockwise um, nut needing to be turned counterclockwise, a standard nut wouldn't fit and of course there are no spares available. So I had to 
uh, go onto eBay and find some reverse nuts. These are ones that go on and tighten in a counterclockwise direction. Luckily those arrived within three days and I was back flying very shortly. One of the problems with the trifecta is the legs are very short and the battery bounces on the ground uh, with each landing. Uh, my battery has taken uh, a bit of a bash um, through hitting the ground and hitting walls and various other different things. So I decided to put on longer legs. I designed these uh, using uh, AutoCAD uh, 123 design and uh, they're available in Thingiverse. Uh, the way uh, I got these printed using Shapeways and the way that they print them is basically uh, whatever colour you want they print them in white and then dye them and you can see through some of the landings I've had the white is showing through the dye. Um, also while deciding what I was going to do on the FPV side I went and designed a shroud for a board camera uh, that I got from Banggood. Again, uh, it's available on Thingiverse and I got it printed by Shapeways. I, when attaching the video transmitter, uh, I noticed that the GPS was loose and I decided that I would um, tighten it up. So I undid the bolts to try and um, reposition it and I noticed that the connector was not attached to the board. Um, if you remember from part one, I had a similar problem with breaking off the connector on the power distribution board. Uh, looking at this connector, it looked like it hadn't actually been soldered on at all. Uh, I ordered a replacement, but I did actually manage to repair this. And it does seem to work in that in Mission Planner I can um, see my location when I got GPS lock. On this as well, I have a micro OSD board mounted here. So the board camera feeds the micro OSD board and then into the video transmitter. Uh, problem I noticed when uh, testing things was that the OSD and the video cut out uh, as soon as I took off. Um, I expected this was uh, due to loading on the 5 volts uh, exceeding um, what the BEC on the power distribution board could cope with. So I had uh, a BEC for FPV that uh, I had uh, previously ordered and this is supposed to give 5 volts out. Um, I mounted this so it was actually behind the firewall and there's a wee bit of space there. Um, what I did notice when it was all connected up was this BEC was only giving out 4.8 volts. Um, I decided that I would drive the servo from the separate BEC so that um, the OSD and the flight controller all had the same 5 volt supply. Um, but I found when I connected this to servo tester, although the servo tester without the servo connected worked fine, as soon as I connected the servo things went a bit crazy. I didn't know whether it was a problem with the servo tester or the BEC. Um, so I connected up the servo, tried to go for a flight, flipped it over onto its uh, top, onto its uh, top side, which is the reason we've now got these grazes on the spinners. Um, but basically I think this BEC, once it goes under load, actually drops below the 4.8 volts that it gives uh, without a load on it. So, threw that away and um, ordered another one uh, from uh, eBay, which um, was actually smaller than that but did have a smoothing capacitor on it, which that one doesn't have. Um, it is now behind the firewall and is performing flawlessly. Another problem I had with the OSD is that the display changing to a vertical column of um, values. Um, looked on uh, the internet and found that other people are reporting this as an issue. 
Uh, one recommendation, not associated with this particular problem, but seemed to work for me, was to replace the video voltage on the OSD with 5 volts. So, although the video transmitter and the uh, board camera both run on 12 volts, um, and that is supposed to go to the OSD and then out of the OSD to the camera, um, I'm actually going straight from the video transmitter to the camera for the 12 volt supply, but feeding um, 5 volts into the video side, and that seems to have eliminated that problem entirely. One of the other problems I have, even though I've got an OSD and I can see what's going on, is there have been several times that the craft has just landed um, due to the battery voltage uh, dropping below a threshold. Although the battery voltage is shown on the OSD, on the screen, you're too busy looking at the screen or looking at the craft and not paying attention to all the other things that are going around. So I decided that I would put in uh, some form of battery monitor. I've been watching some videos on YouTube by Travis Grindle and he was using a potential divider um, that he bought from FreeSky or uh, FreeSky manufactured to actually feed into um, the D4R2 receiver, the same one that I'm using here. I hadn't realized that that receiver had an analog to digital converter on it. So following his video, I decided that I'd put in a potential divider. That's basically two resistors um, wired across the flight battery so that the voltage is divided to be less than 3.3 volts, which feeds into the A2D converter. And then that is transmitted via the um, receiver aerials back to the transmitter and can be monitored there. And as I've got a Tyrannus transmitter, that is monitoring it on my behalf and telling me once the voltage drops below 11 volts for battery low and 10.5 volts for battery critical. I will do a separate video on uh, that particular um, setup. Uh, I've got a Airblade um, antenna uh, from Video Aerial Systems um, and an Alex Greaves design and it seems to be working quite well. Um, I had other circular polarized antennas on this um, but I wasn't uh, getting the range and it turned out to be my own fault because on the receiver side um, it was expecting an antenna with a pin and the antennas I had didn't have pins so it wasn't making any contact and it's basically as if I had no antenna uh, attached to the receiver at all which might explain why I was only getting about 10-12 feet of video signal but that problem is now solved uh, the only thing that is left is the OSD is not showing the GPS coordinates uh, from my little GPS unit. Uh, it's not showing the number of satellites either. I know that it is working because I can see uh, the GPS fix and I can see the GPS satellites in the logs from Mission Planner. But um, it's not displaying on the screen. Uh, still investigating that. Uh, it's not a big thing but it would be good to know when I've got lock before switching into a GPS video mode and discovering that um, I don't have GPS lock and it either uh, doesn't behave as expected or lands uh, as a GPS failure. Uh, thanks for watching. All the best. Bye.